Hey, good morning. Welcome to the Roscommon County Board of Commissioners work session, July 28th. Hybrid meeting accessible by in person or via Zoom. Item number one, Don Lacasse, Child Care Fund FY year end 2021-22 budget. Everybody have uh, Don's report in front of them, please. Good morning. Turn your mic on. Hit the button right there. Pull a little closer to you. There you go. Oh, we're doing. We're still doing Zoom. Okay. All right. Um, for the first time since I've been here, there's a bit of an increase for next year for child care fund. Um, starting October 1st, we get 17 year olds. Um, the state is reimbursing all the expenses for 17 year olds at 100%, but they still haven't told us how we're supposed to submit it. If it's going to be um, the same monthly report that they do now, a separate one, I don't know. So um, we're gonna have to um, keep track of the expenses for 17 year olds separate from um, the rest of the kids. Um, basically, the increase, um, I have about a $100,000 increase in all of the placements. Uh, I'm hoping that we won't need that much more, but I'm budgeting that just in case whatever happens with the 17-year-olds and it gets messed up. Um, I'd rather have a little extra and not have to come back and ask for more. Um, the rest of the increase is basically um, just a little bit of increase in the services. Um, everything increases and uh, wages and fringes. So um, the other other thing is that I've juggled some of the grants around a little bit and um, we have qualified for a $20,000 raise the age grant, and I'm finishing up the paperwork to um, send that in, which will be, again, expenses for the 17-year-olds. The next year is going to be um, a mess. <laughs> Because besides the services that we have to keep track of, all of the juvenile probation officers have to keep track of their time for 17 year olds separate from the rest of the kids. And we have not gotten any guidance from Lansing yet on how we can do that. Is it a percentage of how many kids they have or 17? Um, I'm hoping that's the way it goes because that's the easiest way to do it. But Lansing hasn't approved that yet. So there's a lot of unknowns with all the changes that are going on. Um, but I'm hoping that this little bit of increase is not gonna be a issue. Um, the spreadsheet I gave you kind of shows how things came down and have pretty much been um, about the same for the last few years. Oh. Um, I'll be back in two weeks for um, the load on it. I have to have it submitted to Lansing by August 8th, uh, 15th, 15th. Anybody have any questions on the numbers that I <coughs> presented? Commissioner Allen. I see in 2018-2019, uh, we didn't have any funds for um, placement costs out of state. Have you used any funds this year so far for placement yes. out of state? So we are doing that now. Yes. Thank you. With the number of juvenile facilities that have closed in Michigan, and there have been at least a half a dozen, um, it's really difficult now to place kids anywhere. More difficult all the time. Yes, and now we'll have 17-year-olds added, and um, 
I don't know where they're going to go. Um, on some of the listservs I'm on, it's it's the same question all you know, everybody's asking. There's no place for these kids to go. They get on waiting lists. I think I've got three kids on different waiting lists right now to get into different facilities. That's 17 year olds. That will be 17 year olds too. October starting October 1st. This 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 child care budget start on October 1st too. Yes. Yep, because that's goes coincides with the states. Right. Right. And the total budget is one point three one point one million three hundred thirty nine dollars. At one three three nine, yep, yep. Which is a calculation about one hundred and forty. It's it's probably twelve to thirteen fourteen percent of our total budget. Oh, okay. correct budget. So, and always talk about this. This is one of the commissioners you really don't pull over because if the judge mandated it, you pay it. Not pay it. You cannot have the option of not paying. Correct. And you know, as you can tell from the numbers, you know, we've gotten some things under control. Um, we use um, tether a whole lot more than placement. You know, there's several different um, options that we have. Placement is usually the last resort or the most serious um, kids that have committed normally a a CSC crime, they normally go to placement for treatment. I, I just like to say that um, the job that Dawn has done since she's taken over this perfect, I do appreciate your oversight. Thank you, sir. So by the oversight that we're having on it right now, we are controlling it. Thank you. As much as we can, or as much as you can. And I personally, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, one of the things we don't do as much as we used to is refer the kids to um, Department of Health and Human Services. If we keep them under our supervision, we have more control. So there's certain kids that have to go, but if they don't have to go normally, we'll keep them. Yes, sir. Well, uh, instead of making my comments at the committee reports, just for the information for the other commissioners, Bob and I met with our juvenile detention facility director and assistant director, co-directors recently, and um, they told us that the, the quality of the youth that they're getting now, um, they're, uh, they're, they're more violent and they have to, they've had to enact some uh, rules over who they can take and who they can't take. So now they're they they they're just not set up to handle these really disruptive, violent youth that require a one-on-one -on -one constantly. So um, that's that's the thing that's going on here. That's a dynamic that's in play here. Is the the youths are are kind of evolving into a a place where we have to send them someplace else. We can't keep them in our juvenile detention facility, and that's gonna Part of that's going to partly raise the cost, right? Um, yeah, and normally they're in detention a short period of time um, until we can put them in a placement. And that's, we've got one sitting in, at our detention right now waiting <clears throat> for a bed to open at Shawano. Um, and yeah, it's some of these kids have really gotten. Uh, I don't know, violent is the right word, but you know, they think they can do whatever they want. I'm seeing it more and more, although I'm doing more with holding parents accountable too. Well, we can debate that all day. <laughs> we'll save that for another time, but uh, in regards to the child report here. Thank you, Tom. And with that, we will bring that forward to put it on the motion to accept budget for next year. 15. Okay. Yep. And that's a Sunday, so it's actually going to have to be like the 13th. Right. Whatever. Friday the 13th. Friday the, ooh, Friday the 13th. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Item number two, MERS annual actuary, actuarial evaluation report. Say that real quick. <clears throat> Jody Valentino. So we received this report in June. 
Um, Jim Anderson touched on it when he gave the presentation to the board for the 2020 audit, but I wanted to hit a few more highlights for you because this is going to, um, it already is, but it's, it's going to become even more so budgetarily stressful um, as the years come. So I just wanted to give you, uh, as brief as I can, a overview of the report, what's inside of it, what plans we have, and what the future looks like for us. Um, obviously, the report is for the defined benefit divisions. They're both open and closed. The closed divisions that we have are uh, General Union, which ended in 2010, Friend of the Court, which also ended in 2010. The Sheriff and the Command Unit, which both were closed in 2017, when the union agreed to make some concessions towards their defined benefit to help offset the unfunded liability. And then we have a uh, the two open ones are currently Sheriff and Command, which is this new new version, and the prosecuting attorney's office, which is actually a hybrid plan. The annual contributions will increase about $106,000, um, which is about 13% between 2021's budget and 2022's budget. Um, it's traditionally split about 50-50 between the uh, sheriff staff and the general fund staff for the closed unions. Our variations in the annual contributions are influenced by three major factors. Uh, changes in benefit provisions. So if we were to increase um, any types of benefits that people do receive, which is not something that has been done in a very long time. Um, changes in any of the actuarial assumptions and methods. This is not something that we have control over. This is something that happens every five years with MERS. Um, this is the wage inflation rate for um, the next five years dropped to 3% from 3.75%. The investment return reduced um, to 7.35% from 7.75%. The increase in average mortality went from 77 years to 80 years old. So we're going to make mo less money off of what we currently have in the bank, basically, and people are going to live longer and an increase in assumptions on early retirement rates for public safety based on a lot of the things that have been going on in, over the course of the last five to 10 years. Um, and then our experience in the plan, so basically looking historically at when do people retire, um, how much money do they have, how long are they vested. There are two options. One is a phase-in and a no phase-in to, um, I call it pulling the band-aid basically, to pay as much as you can towards this unfunded liability. We were, for the closed unions, doing the phase-in, uh, which assumes basically that a five-year period, um, we're going to take that whole five-year period and absorb it. So instead of spreading it out, uh, we were going to absorb it, and we have been for several years. However, um, MERS decided this year, their board, that closed unions are no longer allowed to use the phase-in approach. Um, they have to go the traditional five-year rollout period. We do um, do have a phase, the phase in for the sheriff in command and the prosecuting attorneys, but those are actually funded over 100%. So that's not where our unfunded liability lays. In general, the benefit provisions um, are pretty much so the same across the board. There's nothing big about them. Normal retirement is age 60 for all of the unions. Um, the new sheriff in command, which is the current, has a 10-year uh, vesting, which was an increase of two years. And they did increase the employee contributions from 2.5 to 5%. So that was kind of there, I'm sorry, 8%. So that was kind of the big, the big change back in 2017 to help us out. To give you an idea of what we have, we have about 160 to 170 employees, depending on seasonality. Um, our current participant summary is 66 active members, 35 vested former employees, so people that are vested but no longer work for us, and 116 retirees and beneficiaries. 14 people are pending refunds, so they would be, um, have applied and are eligible to receive their portion of the money back, uh, and that's a total of 231 participants in it. 36% of those participating of the total 231 are the ones who are putting any money into the plan. So it, it falls on the employer to fund everything that's left. Contributions right now, we contribute um, 
about 55% more now than we did 10 years ago. So as your budget changes, um, there is one of those areas. We are currently at $1,006,827 annually that the employer puts into puts in. Um, the employee contributions over the course of the period, total dollar amount, have decreased 11%. And that's obviously when you close a plan and you don't have anybody putting into it anymore, but you still have people eligible to draw and earning time, um, that's where that decrease is going to come from. Overall, approximately 79% of our employer payment is for the unfunded liability. Pretty big number. The implications are um, that our employer contributions, they're gonna to continue to increase. We're supposed to peak in about 2028. So we've got about another six and a half years. Um, and looking at that, it's about an increase of 1.25% count compounded. So we would be looking at that last annual payment of about $1,833,000. So that's out there as well. The budgetary increase in the next 17 years um, would come to about $370,000 for the general fund. The estimation based on the MERS reports and the actual aerial is that Ross County County will be at or over 100% funded in 2038. Planning for the future, and this is where I'm going to need the board to do some thinking and maybe put this on for a work session in the future. Um, historically, our practice has been for budgets to be charged to each department with an active participant. So if there's 33 people, 36 people participating, we take that total $1 million and allocate it by current contributions of who's, you know, which, which person is in which department. So prosecuting attorney's office has a lot of people in their department that still participate, so their percentage tends to be higher. What we are going to do with 2022 and talking with Jim Anderson is to create a budget that reflects all active, vested, and retired participants by department. So get that breakdown of the total of 231 total participants and then break it down by department so it's more evenly distributed. And we can look and see this is where those costs were actually incurred from versus kind of this lump thing that we've been doing for the last 20 years. Options moving forward for the board to consider. Um, obviously, it's either increase your assets or decrease your liabilities for the future. You can increase employee contributions. We've done that with the unions beginning in 17. Um, though we can't do that with the closed unions because they are heavy with retirees, so you're not going to see any impact from that. You can make additional voluntary contributions towards unfunded liability. We did begin doing that in 2019 with the interest earned on the treasurer investment funds. So that's something that we have been doing. Um, you can transfer funds from surplus divisions. We don't have any surplus divisions to transfer from. So that is not an option for us. You can look at bonding depending on the market. Um, you can offer different plans. However, we do have a couple things to consider. The first is uh, union contracts, which are five years, um, and the fact that retention and recruitment for public safety positions is horrendous right now. Um, so one of the tools you have is your benefits to, to attract people. Um, you might not get somebody fresh out of the academy being excited to come to Ross Common County for the pension benefits, but someone with eight years of experience and a child on the way sees a great investment and we want to make sure that we can actually staff ourselves. Um, so that's a, another consideration. And then the other consideration um, or possibility is offering participants who are both terminated and vested. So those, how many was there? Uh, 35 vested former employees, you could offer them the opportunity to accept a lump sum payment in lieu of future benefits. So. Those are some of the ideas that I'm going to want you guys to maybe put on a work session and start kicking around. Um, I think we have to be more proactive going forward to make changes. Um, some you're talking about, is that what the road commission? Uh, they actually did it a little bit differently. They did it for their former vested, but they also did it for their current employees as well. So all the employees that were in that defined, defined benefit plan, they agreed to take a cash out of where they were then and now are in a defined contribution plan. And I have a pretty good feeling our union's not gonna go for that. 
as the sheriff shakes his head. Oh. Okay, just thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, any other court? Yes, Ken. That $370,000, is that per year or is that for the 21 years or 27 years? That would be at the end. Yeah, that would be the last increase that we would see. Okay. Hey, any commissioners have any other comments in regards to the question report from Jody? Okay, so we're gonna have to deal with in the near future. Number three, MERS defined benefit purchase of years, Jody Bell. Okay, so we currently um, made the decision, prior to me being here, we closed the ability to allow employees to purchase years of service, which would allow them to then retire a little bit earlier. The large reason for that was obviously when you're looking at 79% of your payment being unfunded liability and a decreasing budget, what sense would it make to offer to pay $40,000 towards one individual's retirement at that point? Um, doesn't seem a smart investment of your cash. The Caveat that we have been approached by the union is to allow those years of service to be purchased, but the employee would be responsible to pay for 100% of the years of purchase, which traditionally about 60% of it would go on us. Um, that would allow for some of the, uh, give me a good word, <laughs> that would allow for some of our more senior members um, to take advantage of the early retirement um, of 50 and 30 versus 55 and 25. Um, Sheriff likes to remind me that public safety law enforcement is a young person's game. Um, and obviously your risks and liabilities, stressors increase um, with age as those things go on. Um, so there are motions on. I did bring it up at the last meeting and had talked to you. Um, but the motions basically specifically say the employee will request the purchase of yours through the administration office and they agree to the employee agrees to fund the MERS calculated years of service purchase at 100 percent that's included in the motions pretty straightforward yes sir any commissioners any questions in regards to uh fine benefit purchase of years okay item number four ntia broadband federal grant so capital connection. Do we need to bring Tim up to Tim is going to come up because I just have a, a couple comments and then he is going to take over on just the financial aspects of the grant itself. Um, this is the ball that I asked to roll with. Um, however, grant writing and assessing broadband costs and services is not something that I am trained in. Um, Brenda Batchelder and Catherine Methner agreed to jump on board right away. Um, Catherine is going to move forward with the grant through the grants.gov for us. Um, I did sign a very, very nice contract with her um, that basically says she'll write the grant for X amount um, and we will utilize the economic development special fund money, non-general fund monies that can only be utilized for these types of purposes in order to pay for those services for her. Um, if for some reason the grant, which is currently, she's at, it's 50 bucks an hour basically, if currently the grant was not approved, she will only receive $500. So she did put that caveat in there, so I do appreciate that. Um, we did have a meeting and have roam, rolled forward with the information basically being set out through Cherry Capital. Um, there is a request from one specific township to have an area included, and I believe we're going to work that into the grant. Um, at the next meeting, um, we'll have something for you to review and approve because we do need Board of Commissioner approval. And we'd also be looking for um, any types of letters from the public or public entities or private entities in support of expanding broadband into um, Ross Common County and throughout Ross Common County. What, you know, what types of services improve as well. So, Tim. Thank you. Um, so the NTIA at our meeting, we 
identified action items uh, based on the scoring of the NTIA and Cherry Capital uh, to the letter of recommendation side uh, should have by the end of the week, Kathy, a um, uh, bullet points of what they would include in a letter of support, highlighting uh, not only broadband, but the economic impact and some other wording that they can use to develop their own uh, structured letter uh, to it. So last time we were here, we talked about uh, the area that uh, we call RDOF wins or RDOF support, which are the areas that have either no broadband or do not have 25 by 5 as defined by the NTIA and by the FCC. And we said that to do that whole area beyond RDOF was about a $15.5 million uh, project. Our our, our RDOF portion, those homes, those thousand homes, is uh, costing about 5.3 million. And so we have looked at that total project and, and tried to uh, distill it uh, not only into a design and a mapping, but also targeted areas where we can actually spot check and verify that they don't have broadband. Um, um, and that came out to 9.3 million uh, for it. The cost per mile, um, and NTIA, by the way, has to use prevailing wages. So that added about 1.2 million to the project. Um, cost per mile is 41,000. It's a little on the high end, but that is primarily influenced by prevailing wages. Um, the material itself is about 10,000 per mile. And uh, the labor portion of the project, which means it's generating jobs for local people, BRE as a, as a construction company we're gonna approach, uh, is about 60, well, 67% of the total cost of the project is labor related at some level. So this is a one year infusion of some fairly good wages and fairly good return of efforts uh, for the people. I don't have a body count yet on that or people count, uh, but I'll have that um, by the end of the week. Um, and so we broke it up into basic elements. The uh, materials itself is uh, uh, 2.3 million. That's what uh, distribution fiber OSP is. That's the mainline uh, fiber components. And on the back sheet, uh, breaks it down to some of the more common elements associated with the outside plant. And it shows what our distribution is. Uh, with NTIA, it's a 12-month project. With our construction season, that means we have about 9.2 months. Um, uh, we don't want to have to extend it beyond that, but there is a provision for it. And weather is one of the available provisions to extend it beyond in order to compensate for weather. Uh, but we're doing everything on a timeline and resource based on 9.2 months of construction. Um, yeah, so far, we have already started setting up meetings with Roscommon Township, Nestor Township. We briefly met with Richfield Township um, just to introduce ourselves. We'll come back with more of a presentation. Um, Lion and Lake and Bacchus are the ones we're focusing on. Those are the townships that are affected by one federal program that we thought would play very well for NTIA to enhance that. I'm not sure who the other township is. Would that be Garish by any chance? Yes. Okay, yeah, we did a small proposal to Garish uh, to uh, uh, take care of Robinson Road area, which has no service. Uh, the interesting thing about that, if we just pop under I-75, about a thousand foot bore, reasonable, uh, we can run Merritt or reach 3MC to the county building for fairly reasonable a fee because uh, Roscommon as a village has not benefited from that reach 3MC network and we'd be able to tie into it. Kind of a, when we looked at the map, it was kind of an interesting bonus if we wanted to invest a little bit more money into that. <clears throat> and I think that's a good thing for, so we're going to, one of the points in NTIA is to prove that the, pro, uh, the project is already in progress. That's an extra 10 points. And so 
from our part, we're going to start applying for the Metro Act permits in each township. That allows us to actually put our plows in the roadway. Um, it's permitted by the County Road Commission, but we have to have permission from each township to do it. Uh, we're, we would like to, and this is where ARPA funds come in down the road, is to begin ordering the material. Right now, if I ordered conduit today, it would show up maybe December. Um, certain fiber is farther out. <coughs> I am meeting with a couple of the suppliers tonight to see if I can improve that and try to get that inventory in more like October so we can get a head start on construction on the NTIA. And uh, we're also working with and we'll start negotiating contract terms and we're collecting petitions from the consumer. So all things in action in order to support the NTIA project. Uh, it's moving relatively quickly and uh, I've got a week worth of meetings next week, uh, meeting everybody to you know, keep it going. Any, any questions? I assume Bacchus is on here for next week. I don't have an appointment yet, but I will uh, get it on. They're meeting with me. first, right? Yes. When do they meet? They meet on August 2nd. August 2nd. o'clock at the back of school. It'd be important. I know it's a smaller township, but since you're looking at that township, you probably better. I, I, you, can, you can probably just get a hold of the supervisor. I will. I will do that. Okay. Yep. Which township would you start first? Well, I guess the first one that's on my list is Roscommon Township. Akis would mump them. They're the third. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, Nestor is the next one. It's a very small one, but, uh, and I've actually got on the lodge board agenda. Good Forest Lodge. Good Forest Lodge, yeah. Right, and that's 18,000 acres and about 200 homes. So it's a fairly large private development that would uh, benefit from the, the offer. So I'll be on the, where I'll be asking for easement agreements to go across their trails and uh, seeing how we could uh, interface with their members um, and get them to sign up. Uh, none of this precludes on the NTIA consumer participation. Uh, that we're looking for all funding opportunities to make this thing successful. Thank you. Uh, and then I have not set up an appointment with Lion and Lake yet, so. Dr. Nestor ready? I have. I talked to the supervisor and got on the agenda. Excellent. Okay. Any commissioners have any questions in regards to Tim? Anything else we need? Just pushing forward, right? As, as quickly as we can. August 17th or August 11th. <laughs> Catherine's on it, right? Yes. Good. Yes, yes. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, item number five, remote voting policy. And also, I'd like to add uh, in regards to our agenda, public comment to be adding agenda items only, and that needs to be included. I found out that it needs to be included in our board rules, so I would like to have some discussion on that. Also, moving forward on that, um, to amend our board rules in regards to the public comment on our agenda. With that, first up is remote voting policy, and that's something that uh, Mr. Russo and Commissioner Melvin have been talking about, correct? Yes. You go ahead and start. Well, it's just, just um, it's, instead of extending um, the emergency COVID thing is and, and not knowing and getting caught up with the 20th century and modern technology and the way we're doing these meetings already remote and in person, that would be, I would be in favor of um, changing our board rules to allow remote voting. Now that could be conditional, I mean, flexible. I, I wouldn't mind putting something in there that says, with the approval of the chairman. That's, you know. Each individual case where someone would want to attend remotely. Um, yeah, that was, I brought this up two weeks ago, Kevin, when you were gone. 
and the more I thought about it is we need to set a couple of rules in there, you know, because someone could run for a position and not show up for two years. With the approval of the chairperson, that would be good, or two times a quarter, you know, uh, just not have it wide open. You know, like two meetings out of the quarter, you could do it remote one meeting a quarter, four times a year, you know, I doubt if it's going to be abused or, but we just need to set a couple of ground rules. What's your thinking about it? I like the ideal. I really do. Um, it's a good idea, but we're elected officials and basically we get two required to have two meetings a month. Well, unless you got a pretty good reason not to be here, I think that you should, you know, show up. <laughs> Military service, medical emergency, national disasters, just basically common sense rules. Every commissioner has a responsibility to be here, as Tim pointed out. And, you know, after all these years, I haven't seen any abuse, but Bottom line is, is if if we, we always have to notify the chairman if we're absent from a meeting. And I think this board has done that throughout the years. But again, those things, medical emergency, national disaster. But the bottom line is, if you're not going to be here for a reason, you need to notify the chairman. Like, I'm going to be going on a humanitarian mission more likely than in October. But the board knows this. The chairman knows this. But if you just don't happen to be here for a meeting because you just didn't want to be here that day, obviously that's unacceptable. At the end of the day, I think the chairman and the vice chairman have some latitude to decide this. But I don't think we've had any issues in the past, and I don't sense there's any future, any future issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, at the same time, that is contained in our board rules under 4.2 attendance. No member of the board may absent himself or herself without first having notified the chairperson of his or her intent to be absent from the scheduled meeting. So, and we have had that occur it, it, once it's or twice. It's in our board rules. I have been, I think there's been some times that I haven't been informed. Most times I have been, but uh, we all know going into these positions, when you run for these positions, you know that, like Tim said, you're required to be here two meetings a month. I did acquire a summary of the Open Meetings Act from Cole Tos Tos Stoker and Toski of Lansing. I read this one I've got yellowed here. There, there is a strong legal argument that a physical presence is required for a quorum. Thus, a member who participates by telephone or video conference while on military duty cannot be counted to determine presence. So, clearly stated in the OMA, I think it's clearly stated <coughs> in our board rules. And I realize what we've been through in the last two years or year and a half. We have emergency situations, which I think we've dealt with as an emergency situation. Personally, I You were going in, sign up for two years, know what the requirements are, and if you didn't, you should have read it before. And as a side note, Mr. Chair, uh, if for some reason, let's say my son was sick and I had to take him to the hospital and I tried to reach out to the chairman, but the chairman wasn't available, so I reached out to Tim. As long as somebody in the board is notified, then I think we've met the criteria. Well, what I was looking at more than anything, this board right here is these committees we sit on. And that's the part where we need to get it approved out there, where if you're seen on a committee and they want to have a meeting online, then we, we're the ones that need to approve it. And that's why I brought it up two weeks ago. The economic development committee has their own bylaws. Oh. Right, but for us to vote, you know, like we had a 911 authority board meeting, and it's up to us to approve any in house committee meetings to do it online. 
for the requirement is, is <clears throat> how many people are on that committee? Uh, six. But the whole thing of it is, is. You have to have a physical presence with uh, four. Who could be remotely. Right, right but he requested. Vote, and only the four can vote. He requested everything online, you know, the meeting. The chairperson. It wasn't an in-person meeting, what I'm saying. So with us well, Zooming. We're not under an emergency situation right now. Why do they want to be Zooming? I know we still are on, we're on hybrid like right now. The, uh, the, the per diem, the mileage, there's, there's a substantial cost savings from people that drive longer distances to committee <laughs> meetings. I well, as long as we're offering hybrid, we need to have that motion, you know, not for the commissioners, but for the committee meetings in the whole, we need to still offer that if we're hybrid. And that's what I was looking at. Yeah, I, I see I see where you're going with Dave. I mean, the thing is, we're paid professionals, we're elected officials. I think we should be here, but, you know, if yeah. it's a county... Uh, I, I and we're doing we're it hybrid. We need to approve something as the commissioner sure. so we could continue with the hybrid meeting. Like, like if Herb, his instance, if Herb was on a, in, a, in a meeting and he couldn't be there, but he's not getting paid, he just needs to be, his presence is required because we need his expertise. That's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see. But until the from. commissioners approve something, it's really a legal meeting. Well, so what? What do, you, what do you actually want to change? I want to change. Want to change. You don't want to change anything with the commissioners as far as board rules in regard. Well, we're going to have to change our board rules to open it up, but I know it won't be abused. But that opens everything up for all the committees that sit on the county for hybrid. Well, don't these committees that we sit on the stuff, don't they make up their own rules for the no. stuff? They, they still have to be approved by the county. So if they do, um, where are the board uh, rules? Where are the board rules? Does it talk about that? It doesn't. Am I correct, Jody? Or Michelle? It doesn't say, and that's why I tried to get you to put something in there a while ago, but it didn't happen. No, but it does need to be in there. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. You're and it's from. real simple, you know, I'm not saying everyone needs to step up and not come to the county, you know, meetings, but it just needs to be overall for any hybrid meeting in the county, you're allowed to vote over Zoom. I don't know how else to put it. Yes. Yeah, right. Correct. Yeah, that's what I mean, but we need to approve it as commissioners and put it in our... Correct me if I'm wrong, but authority board comes with something that has to okay it. But we got to make the initial vote there, on it there, first. My point is, though, is it make a difference how they make a difference how the authority board votes on something has to come to us for our final approval anyway. Right, but we're still gotta, we right. still right. have to. I, I, but, but I think what we may wanna consider is not let Michelle and Dave and yourself and Jody get to sit down and put your heads together. No, no, no. You wanna do something right now? Let Michelle yeah. and Dave and do it. Because there you go. I didn't champion this. I find with that, but whoever needs to do it, but we need we need maybe a little time to sit down and reflect on what needs to be done. So yeah, I'm not just looking for this. I'm yeah. looking overall. Sure, all I, the, overarching. Yeah. You know, my recommendation is maybe to let's get a couple of players to sit down and put this together so we can have a, a policy that's that's in effect. Well, I'll have something for the uh, commissioners in two weeks. Sure. Okay, four weeks. No, I'll sit down with Michelle. Give me time with Michelle. 
now we we're aware now i wasn't aware that committees are meeting remotely and voting if they're doing that without us changing our rules it, does that throw into question their votes and their meetings yes but they were operating under up until june 30th they were operating under an emergency declaration so everything was fine anything that's happened in july is a different story we could do an emergency thing right now to September 1st. That's what I would like to do just to September 1st, and that'll give us months to put something in our We can make that motion today at our next meeting. Let's done our emergency thing. September 1st, they'll give us over 30 days to come up with some right language to put in board rules. That's up to you. I, I, my recommendation is during the break, with the chairman's permission, that we get something drafted up so you can present it to the board so we can add it to the motions. Those are my thoughts. I'll go with the board. September 1st, I'm going to come up with the My thought is, is that we don't need it because I feel these committees are subcommittees. Right, but we still need to vote on it prior I, to before it comes to us. We, we need it. We need it, Bob. Bob and I that's right. We need it. I think it's it protects the, the board, it protects us, it protects the public at large. The public is what we're interested in protecting. I think that it's needed. What would you be basing your emergency order on, declaration on? Right, but emergency is out there. It's still effective in September 1st if we adopted the whole one. It expired June 30th. That was ours that expired. We set that day. But the original one was September 1st. What original one? The one we adopted off the states. We had two days. One, one expired in May and then we expired in April and we extended. Yes. And that's, that's what we did. That's, that's how we did it. I extended. know nothing about a September. Oh, I, went, that I didn't know it was. I thought it was into, I thought we dropped it to, but it went to September 1st. If we do this, you want to extend it till September 1st. Until we come up with the right you're, language. You're, you're declaring an emergency first right now. I don't think he's necessarily declaring an emergency. You're just asking for continuous continuation of the old policy. To September. In other words, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but it doesn't sunset. You're asking for continuance. Right. Until we come up with the right language for our board rules. Okay. I was uh, trying not to talk, um, but I'm going to. Uh, no, you can't sunset it. It expired June 30th. You have to have some measure to put an emergency order into place. Um, increased COVID numbers, requirements through the state of Michigan. And as of right now, as unbelievable as it is, our governor said that everything's open. Um, so take those into considerations when you're trying to decide which way to go, please. Okay. Change our board rules into September 1st, where we could have hybrid meetings. That would be acceptable. And then we'll come back September 1st. Yeah, I, I I stand corrected. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go with Michelle on this one. She's she's the expert. At the end of the day, she's gonna beat me up in the parking lot. So the kicker is is that how do you feel, Michelle and Joe, <coughs> as you deal with the day to day operations? Well, I feel as though Commissioner Russo, you're getting confused as what the hybrid meeting is actually offering. A hybrid meeting, in our sense, is it's allowing access for the public right. to attend our meetings that are being held in person regularly that's the hybrid part of it it's not a hybrid part of it set up so that three of you can be here and the other two can be wherever they need to be that's not what it is and the hybrid meeting it that's that's not what it that's not the purpose of it and i understand that there's some committees that are still choosing to meet uh via zoom if they have that in their bylaws and that's why uh for a little bit of time now i've tried to encourage you guys to require your committees to have bylaws set rules for their committee and how their meetings are going to be run because i know that there's some committee committees that meet and 
they, you know, a Zoom meeting works fine for them if they've got people that are having to come from far away. Most of our people are within the county. I understand that, you know, where you're coming from with the financial, a lot of our committees are not compensated in any way, shape or form for anything that they do. And so that isn't really the issue. Uh, we need to take a look at it. Yes, the board rules need to be amended to determine how, what you're gonna allow your committees to do. I know with the 911 Authority Board, I believe it, it's a little bit more than just amending the bylaws. You have to, I believe um, Vance might be out there in virtual world, but I believe that any changes that you guys make have to be approved. And so yes, ultimately the committees are advisory. They come to the, this board of commissioners for final approval. However, there's still meeting, there's still, there's still action being taken at the committee itself. So it varies. So you do as a board need to be a little bit more specific in your board rules as to how you want your committees to operate. But as far as creating an emergency order, like Jody said, you have to have a reason for it. You can't just, once it's expired, it's like a millage. Once it's expired, it's not a renewal. It's an increase. So you, this expired June 30th. So if you wanted to extend it, it's something that you should have looked at and took into consideration back in June and then expend, extended it at that point if you had cause. Except there's a fact right now. We're not under an emergency order. We're back to, back to things supposedly normal, whatever normal is, all right, and sit on the 911 authority board. Well, I'm using that as an example. I know, but I'm just, I'm using that as an example. When those people agree to sit on that board, they agree to be there physically. Now, yeah. if we're going through a pandemic and there's an emergency, it's a whole different story, okay? We're, we can deal with that if we have to, okay? Yeah. Hope we don't go back to that, but good, but physical presence be required, um, I think we just the way it is. And I, I, I appreciate the, the spirit of debate, but I'm going to go with the county clerk and administrator of control. They persuaded me with their logical argument that we're on the right course. Something that was brought up that we did. I appreciate it. I don't know why we have a discussion in the hall. Tim, anything to add? Um, <clears throat> No, not really. Um, like I said, the idea is we're elected to, when we're put on these committees and we're expected to go to the meetings. <laughs> right. I mean, you can do it hybrid, I understand that, but, but that's part of the job description. Well, I understand, you know, and I've yeah. never missed a meeting or tried not to, you know. Yeah. Okay, anything more on the remote voting policy? Something we wanted to talk about. More to add, Ken? David? No. Okay. Public comment of our agenda. If you go to the board rules, on page four, 5.3, order of business. And pointed out to me that uh, the sample of our agenda that's in our board rules does not correspond with what I at our last meeting in regards to agenda items only under number six, public comment and the items only. I'd like to have some discussion on it in regards from the commissioners on what to do with that. I would like to have number six read, because I included it in today's public comment, agenda items only, please limit to five minutes per person. So, I'd like to make that and have that amended to our board rules in two weeks. There again, I agree. There's a lot of meetings I go to, and the first public comment does have uh, to do with the uh, meeting itself. You know, and the second public comment is for, you know, to bring up what you choose to bring up, and I'd like to continue with that. I'd like to see the item. Into items only. Yes. You? Okay. Um, my next question, Mr. Milbert. <clears throat> yeah, I got it this morning and I gave this a lot of thought in the last few days, so I drafted something up. I value public comment and believe public comment is a fundamental and key ingredient for an open and transparent government. Public comment offers the possibility of intelligent, diverse, and thoughtful remarks from the public to the county board that should be thoughtfully listened to and valued. 
Anytime I have the opportunity to listen and learn to intelligent comments from anyone that offers value in my decision making, I am strongly supportive of it. In regard to the public comment section of the board, I am a big proponent of complete and open transparency in any governmental body and personally would like to keep the public comment section both at the beginning and the end of the board. Five minutes has been the same, it's been our practice for many years. We have a solemn responsibility as a board and individually to have an open mind and to listen, to learn from the public has to say. And I strongly believe we need to continue this practice of the public to provide us potentially valuable input at the beginning and the end of our meetings. However, the chairman and vice chairman, as I understand, have some latitude in designing the board agenda. And if our board rules are voted and changed by majority of this board, these rules could be amended. I, however, would have a difficult time voting for such changes without th thoughtful and persuasive justification. But as a professional who's represented the people I am sworn to rep represent, would not argue or protest further if I was if I was outvoted. I use look at uh, Herb as an example. Let's say Herb wanted to make some comment about the meeting, but he he's on, on limited time. So Herb comes in and makes a couple of a comment. If it's if it's just on board board agenda items, he doesn't have an opportunity to give his opinion. So here's Herb comes in, he's got, got an appointment at 10, I'm just using, I'm sorry, Herb. Herb's got a medical appointment at 10.30. So he walks in, he says, I need to talk to the board about this. And I, so he gives us an input. If he has to wait till the end of the meeting, he doesn't, he's not provided that input. I'd always err on the side of, of ensuring that public has an opportunity to talk. Those are my thoughts, Mr. Chairman, thank you. No, no, no please, no, please don't do that. Thank you. Um, I would agree with the way you've got it written. There's two chances for public comment. Let's keep the first one to agenda items only. And like I said, the second one can be, you know, they have the right to say whatever they want. That's what I got to say. Okay, I've got something here that I'll read from uh, actually from the Michigan Township Association from uh, June 2021. Supervisor and or chairman recognize the members of the public who wish to speak during public comment. As the OMA requires that anyone who wants to speak during public comment period be given an opportunity to do so. Supervisor Chairman should not prevent a member of the public from speaking during that one magic free speech period. Say that again. Speaking during the one magic free speech period, as long as a person is following the board's reasonable and lawful rules. Basically, the only time a person might not be allowed to speak during public comment if that person has already had his or her one opportunity. There's no rebuttal or follow up option required by law or if they have begun to make personal attacks unrelated to the function of the government, at which point the supervisor may ask them for their, to limit their comments. So we're not interfering with any public comment. They're both on here trying to, somebody wanted to come in at the first public comment and talk about one of the motions that on today, that would be expect that would be on for the first one. I just I'm throwing it out there. Discussion of the board. Ken? Disagree. Okay. And that's fine. The, the, the bottom line is we have public discourse. And I use Herb as an example because I think I think it, we need to always ensure the public has that opportunity, especially if they're on bar, unlimited time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll excuse this for our motion there. Board rules? Yes. In words, the only thing okay, and the next thing is be three, four, five minutes. What do you want? What do you want that five to be? Minutes. Five, five, five minutes? minutes, okay. Always more, always more. Are there any other changes that would like you'd like to see be made to the agenda? Oh, no. are, are, you, are you happy with the agenda we've got? Because we can switch to what they call a consent agenda, leave it the way it is, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll put that down for two weeks. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Item seven, workplace, drug-free oh, work. Oh, excuse me. Commission on aging contracts. 
Okay. It was pointed out to us, my right, uh, Jody, jump in here whenever you need to, okay? I'll try to get through this, all right? Because our uh, accountant, James Anderson, has pointed out to us that we have got an expired contract with the commission. Okay, and it's been expired, I think it's been expired for quite a while. Yeah, quite a while. Okay. So in, in looking at that, um, the contract that we're looking that we're looking at doing, we have to put a con as board of commissioners, we have to go, have to go to a lawyer, draft a contract, and then bring it to the COA to contract with the COA for their services. Right? Looking at the different areas, uh, Jody and I looked at, and uh, we looked at a few other counties, and the, but this this contract has to be adopted by resolution. Yes, we have to do that. Terms. Just some clarification. <laughs> Oakland County, Midland County, and what's the third one? Actually, it's Midland County, Wexford County, and Ingham County. Ingham County. Those were the three that uh, responded to the email blast to the administrator controllers as having a 501c3 operate with county millages. Um, I had about and other responses, no, we keep that in county. So I did talk to Betty, you're back there, right? I and I let her know if she knows other counties that, that have this to let us know so that the Board of Commissioners can view those contracts as well, because not everybody responds to email blasts, I get that. Right. Well, anyway, under the terms, Midland has a length of millage, Wexford's is, Wexford's is annually and Ingham is annually, so they do it once a year. Personally, I'm thinking we can go to the length of millage. I, th I think that's sufficient. Somebody jump in. If you guys are opposed to this or whatever, got any input, jump in here, okay? Payment type. Um, did talk to Rebecca in regards to this yesterday, and however they're doing it right now, works fine. I guess I'm going to label that as Wexford County. It's called a general property tax. In other words, it works fine. Nothing's wrong with that. Cost allocation. No, uh, Wexford, in last comment, we would be a no, we would not charge them for a cost allocation. It's not that many checks that we're dealing with anyway. That would be a no, which is the same as Wexford. The other two do do it. A budget is required. All of them said yes to that. That's what we're, you know, we already do that. So that's a yes. Uh, a list of minimum services provided, they're all yeses. And I think we get that now. So that's still the same. Uh, a millage purchase clause, that would be a yes also. What exactly is a millage purchase clause? In other words, that we're contracting. Right. So essentially how this works out is if you were to purchase something um, as a commission on aging with millage funds, that property, if you were to go bankrupt or close or no longer service, would actually come back to the county of Ross Common because it is Ross Common County taxpayer property. That's all it means. So if you buy a 10 laptop computers with millage funds, then those would come back in case of some reason you guys aren't operating anymore. If you use millage funds to buy it, it would come back. So, But that's only in case of dissolvement, basically, of the Ross County County Commission on Aging. As far as reporting, um, be an, an, an annual report, in-person annual report, which we've gotten in the past. Um, additional insured, you've already got that, so that's a yes, and all three of the counties are yeses on that. Uh, invoice for payment, there again, talking to Rebecca, however you're doing it right now, it's working out fine. So that would be the same. And the last thing is, is a, a purchasing policy, and you're already following the county purchasing policies. That's the parameters that I'm looking for my research as far as the contract I've drawn up. Is there anything else to add? Buddy, we got, no, we got enough to get this contract drawn up? We can present it to the COA. Yes, um, if you would so like, I can go ahead and draft that and then we can review an actual uh, draft of the contract at the next worst section 
and the current director would have a chance to look at it as well at that point and get any of her board's concerns or input with that. Okay, so get that loose and tied up. All right, item seven, drug-free workplace. Everybody get a copy of that? The short and sweet of it is, um, I try to go through and find one or two of our policies per year that have not been updated uh, or do not sync well with what our other county entities, like Sheriff's Department 911, um, that have contracts or additional, uh, additional policies and procedures. And our drug-free workplace policy was in desperate need of actually being written. Um, what we currently have right now are two sentences that the employer reserves the right to request an employee to take a drug test for use in the event the employer has a reasonable suspicion of such use. Failure to submit to such a drug test will be grounds for termination of employment and consumption or possession of alcohol or illicit drugs or substances such as marijuana on employee premises or property while on or off duty are a violation of work rules. Um, uh, plain speak, not very good. So going forward, utilizing our uh, three current union contracts and the current 34 circuit court policies, I prepared the submitted drug-free workplace policy. It gives a little bit more detail. Um, there were two areas that I, I sent it out to those, those department heads that could be affected, would have to utilize this for decision-making. Um, and had two, two comments come back to me that I, I wanted your input on, please. Um, one of them was, um, did we want anything that caveats in there, the state of Michigan's marijuana usage versus federal marijuana usage? Um, in talking to our labor attorney, they suggested that that not be something because that's such a fluid issue. Fluid issue. Yes. Um, so I did not include that in there. The second portion in there um, is in let me find it for you. <sighs> Prohibited conduct, so 5G, off-duty use of drugs and controlled substances that may adversely affect an employee's job performance, um, i.e. you got really drunk until four o'clock in the morning and showed up at 8.30 for work still reeking of alcohol and a little stumbly, um, or adversely affecting or threatening to adversely affect another interest of the county, including but not limited to goodwill in the community. Um, there were some questions, two questions brought to me for that. Is that too broad? Um, obviously, when you work for a governmental entity, the expectations of the public are more so than if you work at Rite Aid. Um, so if you're to go out and go to the bar and get in a drunken brawl, um, the public is going to view that a lot differently of a public employee than they are a private employee. So if you want it worded differently, if you want it totally taken out, I'm great either way. I'm just looking for what your what your thoughts are. Any input on that? Yeah, just follow the law. I'll follow the law. In the end of the day, that's what we 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 have to do. Okay. All right. Time for a motion. Also, question as far as the drug free workplace policy. Okay. Oh. We'll be back. We're back here at 1020 for our regular meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Stands, one nation, under God, 
under God, and in this world, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And trustee. Okay. Oh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Smith was a Korean War veteran, uh, the founder of the Marine Corps League for Corporal Jack A. Davenport, number 684. Uh, the man was a remarkable individual who had full of integrity and had tremendous loving uh, companionship for his wife, Celine, for many years and a love for this community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not on. Button on here. Okay, item number three, roll call board members, please. Russo. Yes. Schneider. Yes. Hockenthaler. Yes. Milburn. Yes. Alvin. Here. Okay. Thank you. Item number four, approval of the agenda, please. So move, Mr. Chair. Second. A motion. Milburn seconded by Commissioner Russo to approve the agenda. Further comments from any Okay, hearing or seeing none, roll call. Welcome, Thaler. Yes. Melvin. Yes. Milburn. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Russo. Yes. Okay. Item number five under public comment. Um, it says under ag agenda items only, but I will allow public comment. And point it out. Pardon me? Yes, sir. Who's that? Leroy? Yes. Okay, good. I didn't see I got pointed um, out. You're up there waving. I I don't I don't know if this is well this is actually this is actually it has, it has to do with what you, our guys are proposing about the agenda comments. I can understand why you want to do that, but in perhaps a supreme irony, today's agenda is not available in the agenda center. So any public that wished to comment according to the agenda would not be able to do it. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you for your comments. Okay. I have some public uh, comments according to the agenda. On up. Uh, I object to it. And uh, Commissioner Milburn was right when he was talking about the public uh, comments. And traditionally, the agenda has always been posted uh, well ahead of the meeting. Not so today. Uh, 730 this morning, I went out and looked online. Not there. Uh, anyway, uh, while uh, uh, while it's not legal, while you're not legally obligated to do that, it is uh, certainly, I, I thought, kind of a sneaky thing to do. We're sneaking this thing in on the public comments with not even posting the agenda, and then it's not even posted on the agenda that you're even going to talk about it, uh, public comments in the uh, 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 work session. Secondarily, to change the public comments portion is a violation of the Open Meetings Act, and I'll tell you why in a minute, the way you guys did it. You've gotten ahead of yourselves. For the record, Commissioner Snyder was just personally served, and this board has been personally served a lawsuit regarding uh, a violation you did two weeks ago in the Open Meetings Act. And I suspect that this is gonna be added in there also. Uh, you can change the way you handle public comments. There's no doubt about that, but it has to be done legally. You need to bring a motion, as you discussed earlier, and everyone needs to vote on it. So it can, you can be on the record that the public is now going to be limited to public comment. You've not done that. 
and you need to get better legal advice. You need to explain to the taxpayers the reason you're letting their input be limited from this board. It's not like there's dozens of people in here and there's not any time for them to make comments. We all know the reason you wanna start limiting public comments. It's because you don't want criticism of your actions. I think it's a cowardly act. You are supposed to protect the public. This is your way of protecting yourselves. Additionally, in the work session, Commissioner Snyder said that you're going to modify the public comments and it's not listed in that agenda either. Okay, it's interesting that you're now doing that. After my objections last week that I sent you in via email and after the lawsuit being filed, you guys are making a bad political decision. The public isn't gonna like this. You wanna limit me? That's fine, I understand that. And I will get to the second part because I don't wanna violate what you've already said that this being limited to the agenda, but I had two five minute, uh, Comments made up, ready to rock and roll. So we'll just drag them out for a few months. But I'll be in here every every meeting and drag them out. Okay. Well, limit it and make it differently. That's up to you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time, please? Pay attention up there. Hearing or seeing none. Administrator controller report. So currently there are no changes in any of our lawsuits with the exception of the Choice Plus versus Treasurer. Um, Rebecca Reagan has been made aware of a hearing scheduled. Um, and of course she is on that and in communications with the attorney regarding that case 24 <laughs> seven. Quick legislative update. Um, MAC is working to create a plan with the state to create matching project funds for counties regarding infrastructure projects. So if in the ARP projects um, with the steering committee were to make a decision to work with, say, a broadband project, MAC would like it to have matching funds from the state because obviously the state, thank you, obviously the state um, has received their fair share of ARP funding money as well. There is another uh, set of Senate bills that is going forward again trying to make the managed care portions for our <clears throat> mental health move towards private versus public management again. Just to make you aware, those are Senate Bills 597 and 598. Um, both representatives from Calhoun are sponsoring those. The last two weeks, um, we have posted the Director of Information Technology position on Indeed and on Michigan Works with resumes and cover letters due into the controller's office by August 18th. Gypsy Moth hiring is underway slowly. So if there's anybody out there that would even wanna work a day a week looking for uh, Gypsy Moth masses, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, this is, is not a job that, it's seasonal and seasonal is hard to hire for. So you're really looking for somebody that is willing to give their time walking, you know, outside from 8.30 to four, basically Monday through Friday. Um, shoot, we'll do half days. We're very flexible in scheduling if there's people with other part-time positions as well, but you need the feet on the ground in order to get the data that the state uh, program had required. The Roscommon County Court Security Committee met um, with no change in any of the current processes. Obviously the NTI broadband grant um, is moving forward. We did host our first ever Roscommon County Northern Michigan Commissioners Association meeting. And I just wanted to make you aware that it was voted that they will continue to hold those meetings here um, for the rest of the year. The rest of the year. Yes. There uh, had a meeting with Brenda Catherine and Cherry Capital Connections, which was pretty informative. We did have the juvenile detention meeting. Um, they are continuing to trend roughly 30% below their budgeted revenues. 
some of the reasons that Commissioner Melvin stated. Um, if you can take seven, but you have a youth who is unruly, um, just as a reminder, a little over a year ago, we had one youth who was able to destroy the entire education center within five minutes because juvenile detention staff cannot go hands-on with youth. Um, so if I am 14 years old and I am in the juvenile detention center and I am smashing and bashing, the people that work there are not allowed to do anything unless they are harming themselves. Uh, therefore, you call law enforcement, law enforcement shows up, but um, I think both sheriff and under sheriff would, would support me in saying that somebody can do a lot of damage in five minutes. A lot can happen in five minutes. So they have to limit the number of youth that they accept in those cases so that they can do more one-on-one -on -one interactions and monitoring as well. The audit and single audit have been submitted to the state and federal government and have been accepted. Our quarterly indigent defense reporting was submitted and accepted. Our solid waste management plan has not been accepted. Right. Um, apparently, there is the need, there was a need for an official motion um, for the actual planning committee to approve the 90 day public comment prior to the notice being in the paper. Additionally, um, there should be a resolution or notation in the minutes for when action was taken to push the final approval of the plan to the Board of Commissioners. We will be working with the state to see um, would they like us to start this process over again? Is there a way to uh, to make corrections without restarting? But whatever they ask, that is what we'll do. We have had uh, a slew of FOIA requests lately, and one of those actually led me to an idea um, regarding the American Rescue Plan Act funding and uh, meetings by the steering committee. And I think that we should probably create some sort of a spreadsheet that we could update as uh, ideas are approved by the Board of Commissioners and presented forward so that if there is public input or uh, concerns that could be right out there on the front page with, you know, ARP on the Facebook page. Some people are paying attention. Um, other people probably don't even realize that there's $4 million that can be put into certain projects within the state. Um, additionally, there was a county in Michigan that chose to uh, immediately take actions to award larger sums of money to the boards of commissioners um, and hire administrative officers. And I think that that will put people on red alert. It certainly um, has put me on red alert and definitely solidifies my request that everything go through the steering committee and then come to the Board of Commissioners for our public approval prior to being spent, hence why we have a motion for vacuums on <laughs> for just to make sure that the public is aware um, and the Board of Commissioners are very clear on what is being purchased. Additionally, um, we do need to have a meeting, uh, myself and Dr. Hunter, in regards to our funeral homes and pick up and transportation of our um, medical examiner investigator required deaths within the county just need to solidify um, pricing again and to have an organizational meeting with them. And then the very last thing is in a few hours here, I get to participate in a interview for the Michigan County Government Communication Practices Project, which is a uh, coalition of professors from Clemson University and from Michigan State University. Uh, so they're going to be probing on how you communicate and then they will be providing feedback to everybody that participates on better ways to communicate to the public. So then I can bring that back to the Board of Commissioners or some, some better ideas and maybe some better policies and practices for you to adopt. That's all. Okay, have anything to report? Questions of Jody's report, please. Okay, thank you, Jody. Your correspondence, uh, American city government, and I, hopefully I got this right, but that's on, contained on pages A1 through A6, Crawford, Cross Common Conservation District, uh, 
summer 2021 newsletter. It's on pages B1 through B10. State of Michigan Brownfield Development Authority, a letter on C1. Um, D is the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, one-stop ransomware resource, uh, uh, D1, D2. E is the Wexford County copy of resolution in regards to uh, the Secretary of State by appointment only. F is a bet life today, bet fest set for 2021, F1 to F3. G is a Michigan DNR notice of variance application, G1. Do commissioners have any questions in regards to correspondence? Please. Okay. Month the department reports. Ross Common Central Dispatch, June 21st, on pages 29 to 37. Uh, Ross Common <clears throat> County Animal Control. Put that screwed up. Two of them on there, right? Right. And then uh, Sheriff on page 38, Village Report. B is a June report from the Sheriff's Department on page 39. Juvenile Detention Center, last on page 30 to 39. Questions in regards to department reports, please. Yes, sir. Okay, any other comments from any commissioners this time? Okay, hearing none. Item number nine, visitors. Mr. Rudy, come on yes, up. I'd like to introduce come on, to come on, the board and to the public. Come on up, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. That's where the microphone is. <laughs> Put him on the spot. Push the green button, please. You bet. All right. Good morning. I'd like to introduce to the to the commissioners and their staff and the public uh, my grandson Parker Udy, who's visiting me from uh, Ada Township, Michigan, where he will be in the eighth grade this coming fall. Parker is very active in lacrosse, fishing, and any other activities that Grandpa can get involved in up here at Higgins Lake. He has uh, he has two brothers, and uh, they just got a new puppy, I think, last week. So uh, I thought it would be good to get Parker. Uh, Come to these meetings to start to uh, to start to see what happens in, in, in government at the county level. And he uh, also reminded me that he attended one of our township board meetings in 2020. So I just wanted to introduce Parker to the board. Welcome, Parker. Welcome. 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 Grandpa taking you out for lunch now. Yeah. Subway. <laughs> okay, on unfinished any unfinished or new business. Um, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put read this into the record, but uh, we've been uh, this is how this works. Myself and the board of commissioners have been served with a summons for a violation of the open meeting. Record. With, with your permission, Mr. Chair, it, it, I, I did make the approval today, but let the record <coughs> that you did allow public comment to, to transpire as as per our old board or as per our old board rules. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any other unfinished or new business, please? Okay, hearing none or seeing none. Item number 10, unfinished business. <coughs> motion number 11, motions and resolutions. Well, you're up. Move to authorize up to $2,500 in American Rescue Plan funding for the purchase of HEPA vacuum cleaners as requested by Nick Johnson, Director of Maintenance. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Made by Mr. Milburn, Mr. Milburn, seconded by Commissioner Muckins. I'd like to authorize $2,500 of the American Rescue Plan. Purchasing. Questions from any commissioners at this point. I believe this is the first expenditure of that money that we received in regards to the American Rescue Plan. Helps. Reader seeing none. Roll call. Melvin. Yes. Russo. Yes. 
Snyder? Yes. Buckenthaler? Yes. Kilburn? Yes. Motion carried. Move to appoint the following to the American Rescue Plan Steering Commission Committee. Rebecca Yunker, Northern Michigan Child Assessment Center, Sheriff Ed Stern, Ross Common County, Commissioner Robert Schneider, Ross Common County, Georgine Thompson, Catholic Human Services, Ed Bergeron, Economic Development Corporation, Brenda Batchelder, Economic Development Corporation, Shannon Phelps, Northwest Michigan Community Action Agency. I'll make that motion. Second. Motion is made by Commissioner Mel Melman, seconded by Commissioner Russo to appoint the following people to the steering committee. American Rescue Plan. Dunker and Sheriff Ed Stern, myself, Eugene Thompson, Ed Bergeron, Brenda Batchelder, and Shannon Phelps. Further discussion from any commissioner? This is an actual group of individuals that have a diverse background and I think add value to what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Trainer hearing. No other comments? Roll call. Buckenthaler? Yes. Melbourne? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Russo? Yes. Melvin? Yes. Motion number three, please. Move to adopt and administer the MERS Defined Benefit Plan Adoption Agreement, see attached, Division 7201-02, effective July 1, 2021. Adoption of agreement will allow full-time employees of Division 7201-02 purchase service credit for years of service in their designated defined benefit plan at no cost to the county. The employee will the employee will request the purchase of years request through the administration office. The employee agrees to fund the MERS calculated years of service purchase at 100%. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Nope. Oh. Go ahead. I got two here. Uh, Commissioner Muckenthaler made the motion. I'm going to see I will second it, correct? Yeah. David, okay. <laughs> I have two of you tie at the same time. Okay. Any further comment from any commissioner, please? We are seeing none. Roll call. Uh, Melvin? Yes. Melvin? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Russo? Yes. Buckenthaler? Yes. Motion carried. Four. Elon, sorry, I got my. Notes mixed up here. Too many things at one time. Move to adopt and administer the MERS Defined Benefit Plan Adoption Agreement, see attached, Division 7201-20, effective July 1, 2021. Adoption of agreement will allow full-time employees of Division 7201-20 to purchase service credit for years of service in their designated defined benefit plan at no cost to the county. Employee will request the purchase of years request through the administration office. The employee agrees to fund the MERS calculated years of service purchase at 100%. So move. A second. So second by Commissioner Wu. Welcome, caller. Further discussion on motion four, please. Seeing or hearing none, roll call. Melvin? Yes. Melvin? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Welcome, caller. Yes. Russo? Yes. Great. Move to adopt and administer the MERS Defined Benefit Plan Adoption Agreement, see attached, Division 7201-21, effective July 1, 2021. Adoption of agreement will allow full-time employees of Division 7201-21 to purchase service credit toward years of service in their designated defined benefit plan at no cost to the county. The employee will request the purchase of years request through the administration office. The employee agrees to fund the MERS calculated years of service purchase at 100%. I'll make that motion. Second, Mr. Chair. Made by Commissioner Snyder, seconded by Commissioner Aye, please. Roll call. Russo? Yes. Buckenthaler? Yes. Uh, Melvin? Yes. Melbourne? Yes. Schneider? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Michelle. Item 12, committee reports. This is Commissioner Muckenthaler. Um, on the 22nd, we had a gypsy moth meeting to see if we can get more hires for the uh, for the gypsy moth program. Uh, and that's all I had. Commissioner Rousseau, I had a homelake improvement board meeting last night, and that's all I had. Thank you. 
Melbourne, Melbourne, whichever one, jump in. NMCAA with Bob and <clears throat> did a picnic yesterday with the COA board, which was uh, very nice out there at the at the Ross Common Village Park, or I'm not sure. It's a beautiful park, and I thought it was nice, a, a beautiful pavilion too. And that's all, Mr. Chair. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Well, as far as my report on the 16th, <coughs> with uh, Senator Kurt Vanderwall, uh, Ashton Bortz from uh, Representative Molinar's office. Me too. I, I'm getting there. <laughs> I forgot, Bob. <coughs> Mr. Milburn, myself. Uh, Dave Fultz and uh, Superintendent uh, David uh, Patterson. Hey, very good meeting with them. Where that facility? Long if you haven't been through there, you need to drive by there and see what's happening. Nineteenth, Roscommon County hosted the Northern Counties meeting. Um, Thirty-four, thirty-four, thirty-eight counties have participated. 34. We we had a good turnout and good donuts too, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> and at 1.30, we had the juvenile detention center. Um, the report was contained on the juvenile in here. Referred to it. Where is it? Included in the correspondence, correct? Department reports, okay. Oh yeah, it's under for number E. They're running, it's been a difficult year for them, but they're running probably thousand dollars. They're coming into the time of year when they over where they can. Less and less of those facilities take, but like they did to before, you're getting more violent. Juvenile in there. So, uh, on the 22nd, we had the agenda meeting. We also had uh, Commissioner Milburn or uh, Muckenthal and myself and Jody attended the off meeting. So, right. You know, which you just mentioned, Mr. Chair, you know, it, it shows the difficulty not only in child care fund, but the difficulty that our law enforcement has to do. On a daily basis, that's why it's, it's so important. Who is public officials and the public fully support our police department? They have a tremendously difficult job as the juvenile officers over in our detention center. Thank you. Well, um, just uh, Julie, you might want Julie may want to note this down for August. I believe our meeting in August is on the twenty fifth <coughs> for the work session. I'd like to have. We're going to have. Um, Health officer from Central Michigan District Health Department come up here and give a report in regards to the health department. Okay, it'll be at the nine o'clock work session. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. Anybody else got anything to add? Any reports? Public comment. Yeah. Beauty Garish Township. I promise I won't take five minutes. I just want to give everyone an update. Our utility authority for the Garish Line Utility Authority meets every Monday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, it's an open meeting. We've had the uh, last few Mondays, we've get our engineers give PowerPoint presentation on, on different aspects of the collection system, the sewer treatment plant. And uh, this Monday morning, they're going to give a PowerPoint presentation on the concept and, and use of directional drilling, which they will be using extensively to install the sewer. That's Monday, 9 o'clock. The, the residents have been very, uh, we've had good attendance at our meetings. We've had as many as 35 residents show up at these meetings. They, they are given the opportunity to ask questions, view the presentations, meet the utility authority board members, and it's, a, it's been a great way of getting information out to our public. I want to re also remind the commissioners that on the 27th of August, we have the high school auditorium reserved at 6.30 p.m. That's a Friday night. 
and uh, they'll get the uh, full presentation of the concept of the sewer, the sewer plans, the uh, years of construction, you know, a lot of information will be, be shared with the public at that time. And I would invite any of you uh, to come and join us Monday at 9 o'clock. Thank you. And also, uh, Dave, yeah. also you've got a meeting scheduled, and this will be for uh, Alvin and Commissioner Gusto, but you've got a sewer authority meet and greet with Senator Vanderwall right here in this room. Dave the third, correct? Well, I have to confirm that with Michelle as far as the room location, but it is Tuesday. I asked him to do that. Well, I don't know, just put some corn out there already. Right? Yeah, yes. I, I, I'm going down to her office after this meeting to, so we check the calendar. You schedule that. You're, you're hoping to schedule that at 1230, correct? Right? Yeah. All right. All right. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Today. Thank you. <laughs> At the last meeting, uh, Chairman Snyder did not allow me to speak during the first comments, uh, public comment session and made up some new rule without uh, the consent of this board. And that was a violation of the Open Meetings Act. And you tried to do the same thing today. Uh, however, it's on the agenda to limit public contact uh, comments. Uh, so changing it verbally is certainly an admission that you knew that you guys were wrong. After the last meeting, I told both Commissioner Snyder and Milburn that what this commission did in not allowing me to speak in the first public comment session two weeks ago was un-American and just because they didn't like what I was going to say, did not give them or this board the right to not allow me to say it. I'd now like to add that it was a cowardly act and it was illegal. With that being said, it's clear that this board is refusing to look into Commissioner Snyder and, and Controller Valentino's untruthful statements they made on March 13th, 2019 when Chairman Snyder said, other counties have done this. And Controller Valentino stated, lots of other counties have done this. And I actually have a couple of variations they have done regarding the resolution this commission passed two weeks later. Those statements were untrue. They were lies. If you do not investigate those untruthful statements, you are covering up those lies to protect the chairman and the controller. Your actions are willful neglect of duty, which is a misdemeanor punishable by imprisonment of not more than one year or a fine of not more than $1,000. And if you don't think it can happen to you, ask Governor Snyder. On Wednesday, yeah, he's being sued for, uh, Governor Snyder, Governor Rick Snyder. <laughs> Give me some more time. Okay. On Wednesday, March 27, 2019, at 1030 a.m. in this very room, the very day you passed that resolution, I, I spoke in length in opposition to it and submitted a FOIA request to Controller Valentino for the variation she spoke of. It said, Jody, it was a pleasure talking with you again today. You had mentioned that your motion was designed after some of the lakes in Oakland County. In that regard, I'm making a FOIA request. Is If there's any other information that you think would be helpful that is not in document form, I'd appreciate you passing that on as well. Please provide any and all correspondence and documents used or written since January 1, 2019 until the present time regarding the legal levels on Higgins, including but not limited to DEQ, DNR, any correspondence or documents used in drafting the motion entitled requirements to petition, petition change to the lake level control structure resolution. Valentino responded nine minutes later, right in this room. I'll get it to you by next week. I know it's minimal and mostly in my emails. A few minutes after that, she handed me a few other emails that we'll talk about later. At 4.32 that same day, Valentino sent me another email stating there are a few of, here are a few of the links mentioned or reviewed. I would suggest that you review the recordings of the last meeting, which are online under agenda's minutes. The commissioners had a discussion at that work session. There were three links. The first was to Oakland County website where there was nothing concerning any variations Valentino mentioned in her comments. Oakland County Senior Attorney John Boss responded to a FOIA request later saying Oakland County does not have any rule, resolution, etc., regarding lake levels. The second link was to the Michigan statutes referencing the same public act Senior John Bosch Senior Attorney John Bosch reference. The third link she provided was the document I provided this commission in the last meeting, procedures for stabilizing inland lake levels, et cetera. There wasn't anything regarding the variation she referred to when she said, lots of other counties have done this and I actually have a couple of variations they have done. 
Seven minutes later, I responded and said the following. Unfortunately, the document you provided the link to in the printed email, the one you say you used to draft the motion, only refers to establishing or changing the legal level and has nothing to do with what is required to maintain the legal levels, just as I mentioned in my comments today. There's a big difference between what it takes to establish or change the levels and what it takes to maintain the legal levels. If you did run your motion by Mary Beebe, she should have informed you about that. I wish this board would have taken Mark Milburn's advice today and tabled this for 30 days and obtained another legal opinion. I also have a request to Oakland County for what they require to maintain the legal levels. When I get that information from Oakland, I will forward it to you. I wish you would have investigated more thoroughly what is required to maintain the legal levels more closely as that is well defined in the statutes. Below is a link to the statute that provides for maintenance. Notice, it doesn't require two thirds approval by lakefront owners. I hope this helps explain the commissioner's responsibility and in essence, they passed an illegal provision as I have been saying. I'll continue later as I think my time just expired. Thank you. Any um, other public comment at this time, please? Oh, hello. Hello, Leroy. Um, I'd just like to say that, um, make a couple of comments. Um, I don't think we got our money's worth this year with the gypsy moth treatment. Um, a lot of our trees were defoliated and there are thousands and thousands of gypsy moths flying around my neighborhood right now. Um, secondly, can someone, how does it happen that the juvenile detention center staff are not able to physically manage the youth? Can somebody what, tell what, me what, that? That's under state regulations. I, I don't know all of them, but also Sure, sure, sure. Why don't you come up because I don't think you're on mic, so Leroy can hear you, okay? I'm bringing him up, Leroy. Okay, thanks. I can't answer much of your question because it's all regulated by the state and has nothing to do with the, the county or the sheriff's office or jail. Our rules are completely different, but the state regulates how they can handle juveniles when it comes to physical force, and they set the parameters on that. Um, best bet would be to talk with your director of the juvenile detention center because for years we used to train with them or train their staff on how to handle resistive behavior and the state came in and said that they're no longer allowed to do that so and I know Mark when you worked that, in the Sheriff? state facility and what's that? I said when was that? Oh that was at least three to four years ago yeah, it's been several years training. now Leroy okay but just a little background. I, I retired from I retired from juvenile justice after a 31 year career. Um, at Nicole yeah, Central. I, I, I know the state came in and did a uh, evaluation um, of their facility and what their training was for use of force to control resistant behavior, and they were basically told that <coughs> law enforcement tactics and techniques. Are not uh, allowed in that setting compared to what they're supposed to use. Does that make if that makes any sense? Okay. Answer your question. Yeah, I guess. Um, I, I I don't see how it's going to work. Presumably, you're going to call law enforcement to control youth, and they're going to charge them and then give them back to the detention center. Uh, all right. Good Thank question. you. <laughs> good, good question. Yeah, right. Any other public comment, please, at this time? Yes, sir. Take your time. Just push the button there, okay? There you go. Yes, my name is Dennis Warner, and I would like to personally thank and give the uh, Sheriff Department a comment on the great job that they're doing, not only for uh, drinking and driving, but also drug. I've seen them in action, and they're doing an awesome job as far as, you know, getting our roads safer and taking care of the problem we have out there with uh, 
you know, drinking and driving and drugs. And I think we should give them a, you know, hand of applause if we can, because they're doing such a great job. Of this. Pressure every day by the public, you know, with cameras and all this stuff now, but they're doing a great job and they, de they deserve more praise than what they're actually getting from the public. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other public mm -hmm. comments at this time, please? Are you up there in Zoom land? Are you there, everybody? Okay, thank you. Oops. So move, Mr. Chair. 14, adjournment. Yep. Who's making a motion? Melbourne. No, no second. Motion made by Commissioner Melbourne, second by Commissioner Russo. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.